So I was just um, demonst just talking through the key guidance documents that are available. Okay, and then I was just talking through the requirements of assignment A, um, highlighting um, that there are on the main essay, it's six marks for AO1 and 18 for AO2. So the focus should be much more heavily on analysing linguistic and structural devices and their effects. <clears throat> and um, just mentioning the two word count, so um, 650 to 800 for the essay on two texts from part two of the anthology and just six marks for the commentary, which is, should be about 200 to 300 words. And um, I was just highlighting that there are no marks for comparison. <clears throat> so you need to think about that when you set the title. OK, so a few comments from just picking out the main points from the summer moderators reports. Um, so, generally speaking, um, the moderators found that where students had been given a t variety of tasks, uh, they were more successful. So, there were obviously some centres where um, perhaps a large number of students all wrote on the same two texts with the same title. So, students had had um, not, a, not a great deal of choice. and that kind of came out in their level of engagement. Um, a reminder once again that comparison is not rewarded so that the title shouldn't be set um, based on comparison and the structure of the essay does not have to go from one text to the other, one text to the other in, in the way that a comparative piece would. Um, an easy way to think about what the AOs are is, is AO1 is for for what, what's in the text, but AO2 is for how the writer expresses those ideas. The moderators recommended that AO2 is flagged in the task, so there are words in the task which remind students that what they need to do most of is analyse how language is being used. And um, uh, some centres set very open titles, which seemed fine for strong students, but for those who will struggle more about knowing what to say, it's a good idea to use bullet points to sort of direct them more fully. <clears throat> we'll look at that more when we come on to the titles. And the commentaries, these should definitely be a separate piece to the main essay. The moderators saw some examples where um, the students have been directed to include them as a paragraph in the main essay. Um, that's not correct, it should be a separate piece. The, the main idea of the commentary is that it should allow students to, just, to explain why they chose the two texts they did against the background of all of the texts in part two of the anthology. Um, and students shouldn't be doing their AO2 analysis in the commentary. That should be kept for the, the essay itself. So again, the moderators saw some examples where there wasn't much AO2 analysis in the main essay, and then there was quite a lot in uh, the commentary. Um, the commentary has to be marked against the uh, six mark uh, commentary mark scheme, so that's not to the student's advantage to advise them to proceed in that way. Okay, let's look at assignment B. Okay, so yeah, imaginative writing. So this is a piece of writing, again, it's 650 to 800 words. Um, Students can respond, must respond to a teacher devised coursework assignment which will allow them to address AO4 and AO5. So AO4 is um, adapting form, tone and register for a specific purpose and AO5 writing accurately and with variety. Again, let's just look at what the moderators had to say, having seen the first set of work. 
Um, so these points are um, actually some of them. I seem to have. Sorry, I skipped a slide there. So on the imaginative writing, the moderators said that most students had tackled the task really well and were writing freely and accurately. And in quite a few cases, the student's achievement on um, assignment B was notably better than on assignment A. And they were drawing, they were thinking perhaps this was to do with the amount of choice that students had been, had been given on um, assignment A. So if they had been sort of stuck with a task they didn't really like, they had done less well, whereas on assignment B, um, where they'd had more freedom to follow what they were sort of passionate about. Um, they, the moderator saw uh, a good variety of tasks. They were mostly narrative. There were some to literary texts or to texts in the anthology um, or to sort of opening lines from particular um, novels or other literary pieces. There were some hard boiled thriller type narratives, and um, the moderators sort of noted that at times the content was not suitable. Um, and with, uh, I guess, with with all of these, one thing that students need to, th you know, that obviously they need to think, are you as their teacher comfortable reading what they've written? Would their parents, head teacher, etc., be comfortable with it um, in terms of just the content? And I suppose, generally speaking, students tend to write better when they write about something that they have some kind of experience of. <clears throat> Um, the, the the moderators saw some examples, but not very many, of sort of personal and descriptive writing. But where students had attempted that form, the result was usually quite good. Um, so we've just got a few comments on um, more general highlights now on the whole submission. So there are kind of a whole range of points at the top um, about the practicalities of the submission. I'm not really going to go into those because um, they were really covered by the submission guidance, which I directed you to at the beginning. Um, and I will show, I'll go through that at the end if we have time, but I'm aware that everyone has to go off and teach, and teach probably fairly at nine o'clock, if not slightly before. Um, but let's just go, I will just flag moderation because there were some instances where um, the moderators felt that there was not adequate moderation. Generally, where there was good an annotation, um, it was much more easy to uh, agree uh, teacher's marks. So yes, I was saying that um, do award full marks if the work meets the criteria in the um, level five descriptors. Um, avoid over rewarding at the level three, four or four, five boundary. There was some evidence of that. And just a reminder that the annotation is to the moderator only, not to the student. Um, and should never be sort of corrections of the work because obviously when the student um, puts their um, submits their work then then that's it and anything that you write on the work is for the attention of the other teachers in the department or us as an awarding body. So um, let's just think now a little bit about setting suitable titles. So yes, assignment A. <clears throat> Don't forget to flag AO2 using words like how does the writer present or explore how the writer presents or analyze. As we mentioned before, uh, if possible, give the students some choice, let them choose their own pair of uh, texts and titles. Um, the commentary should be a separate piece and don't forget maybe using bullet points for weaker students. For assignment B, the task should allow students to cover AO4 and 5. 
Um, they should be able to choose a task that matches their interests and abilities. So in any group, you're going to have stronger and weaker students and obviously they'll all have different interests. So it's unlikely that one title is going to suit all. You can link the assignment to the anthology, could be to one of the anthology, for example, in part three of the anthology, which is not used for language. Um, avoid far-fetched or unsuitable stories, which would be difficult to tell in the word count. So um, I think it's quite a good idea to sort of give students exposure to texts that are written of this length, so very short, short stories, um, because there is the risk, of course, that students will say, oh, fantastic, I want to write a story about X, and then they'll, you know, off they'll go uh, with their um, story, and then um, they'll get sort of halfway in and realise that they've used the whole word count already, and then they don't know how to finish it, and then they say things like, and then I woke up, and it was all a dream. <clears throat> And that doesn't allow them to be rewarded highly for AO4 because they haven't um, achieved a successful structure and they haven't met the purpose of you know, telling the narrative in a sort of sensible uh, or plausible narrative arc. So um, it's a good idea to show students some examples of uh, short narratives or to think carefully before you start of um, the uh outcome and, and do some planning um so coursework can feel like hard work for everybody it can go on longer than you intend it to with students <clears throat> one way to kind of avoid that is to set it up very clearly at the beginning so um provide students with an overview of the whole project to um which shows how long it's going to take, how you expect them to work, how to lay out quotations if they're using any. Um, they will be, of course, for, for assignment A. Um, and we're going to have a quick look at how you might do that now with the documents. I, I've put this document on the website already as a Word document. You can then adjust it if you like for your purposes. So let's just get that up for you. So yeah, in, in order to make it clear what you're expecting of students, you could offer them something like this. So you've got their name, um, you state clearly what assignment A is, <clears throat> how many words, and then you've got the first section, which is the essay, AO1, and I've just put a kind of student level reminder of what AO1 is, and AO2, how, what kind of language and structure the writer uses to present the events, people, settings, events in the texts. My two texts, so this is kind of assuming that you will give the students some choice of um, which texts to write on, and then why I chose these two texts. So if they're thinking right from the beginning why they put those two together then it's a kind of preparatory work for the commentary and one thing you could do is obviously you know get students after they've read all of the texts to discuss in class debate why these two texts go well together and those two texts don't um, and that will all be sort of fuel for their commentary um, here this explains what the um, purpose of the commentary is, what should be in it, the format, so how many words, what font, how to present it, double spaced. Remind students to um, put a word count on them. And then we come to practical details like the deadlines. Um, so I mentioned here, but I'm going to talk about it later as well. Just make it clear to students that you, how many um, versions of the coursework you're going to see. The general and best practice is only to look at one draft, otherwise the coursework can start to take on uh, disproportionately large dimensions. So you'd say to them, I'm only going to see your coursework once, make sure that it's completely finished when you hand it in. Um, so 
you've got the deadline when you're going to return it and then when the final draft will be due and then I've got a range of titles here and I've drawn these from um, the various guidance documents and from the summer um, moderator report um, so you'll see in each of them um, that I've flagged AO2 so how the authors use language and structure to present characters, how do they use language and structure to present childhood experiences, etc. And at the end, I've just put one example with bullets. So we were talking before about supporting students who might struggle a bit more. So to what extent do writers use unexpected endings, blah de blah Why is each ending unexpected? Were there any clues, etc. So there's just some um, bullets there. Just remind students about plagiarism. It's not likely that they would need a bibliography for this coursework, but if they do happen to be using any secondary material, then they should, of course, tell you about it and write that at the end of their coursework. And then there are just some, um, there's just some advice on saving your coursework in different places. It's really obvious, but unfortunately, I'm sure it still happens that students do lose all their work after working on it for a long time. So that's an example of how to set up um, assignment A. Um, I think I've probably done an assignment B, um, one of these as well, um, although I didn't see it in my folder. Let me just have a quick look. If you've got any questions, you could take this moment to, um, to type them in if you like. I'll just take that back out. Um, so I'm just going to cover feedback, so what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, so as I said before, make sure that students know that um, you're only going to look at their work once and then return it with feedback um, before they start. On the screen you can see what JCQ allows. Um, so the basic thing is that you can review candidates' work and provide oral and written feedback at a general level and then allow them to redraft. What you may not do is provide specific detail on how to improve drafts to meet the assessment criteria, give detailed feedback on errors and omissions which limits candidates' opportunities to show initiative themselves. Um, <clears throat> So it doesn't make any difference whether the feedback is oral or written, um, but you're only allowed to give general feedback. So um, with a view to that, obviously some of you will feel there are times when you want to give more detailed feedback, but it's not allowed. So I just want to show you um, something that I've devised that can help with that. Um, so this is just like the co a coursework checklist. So maybe uh, the lesson before students are due to submit their coursework, you could give them something like this, and this allows them to self-check their work and gives them the opportunity to go away and improve it before they do submit either the first or the final draft. So there are just questions about um, formatting, putting the full title of the task at the top of the essay. Again, this sounds really uh, basic, but uh, moderators did say that they received some essays which just said poetry assignment at the top with no um, pro word, properly worded task. Um, that's obviously more difficult for them to moderate, to know well, has the student done what they were, or what, what is the student intending at all, because there's no um, fo real focus to the essay. Um, I've given roughly the same number of words to each of the two texts, that's what they'll be aiming at. Um, any uh, quotations or abbreviations for text titles are used consistently. 
Um, each of my paragraphs includes at least two quotations. This is on assignment A, obviously. So uh, any points that the students made are supported with the texts. I've used PEE -E or LPQE as I preferred to build up points. If I've mentioned a literary device or a linguistic device, I've explained what effect it has. Um, I've used, I've signposted what my essay is doing. You get the idea. And then for uh, the commentary, I've explained why I chose the two texts and why I eliminated other texts. I've not put any AO2 analysis in my commentary that be belongs in the essay. And my commentary is a separate piece of writing and I've written two to 300 words. For assignment B, um, sort of a slightly different approach because it's being marked for different AOs. Um, so I've shaped my writing so that it matches the purpose. I've polished it. My writing has a clear structure. There's an opening, some kind of a development, a climax or twist, resolution. I've used different kind of sentence structures. I've used all these different punctuation marks. I've got some detailed description somewhere. I've used some imagery somewhere, etc. So that's just you know, if they can't tick these, then it means that they haven't, they probably haven't actually finished their coursework and they should take it away and have another go. So those are available in Word on the website. So I hope you find those useful. Um, I might just point you to a couple of documents on the website. I'll show you where um, I've put these uh, documents already for you to download. You can reach me at te teaching English at Pearson.com if you have uh, any questions. OK, and I'm just going to show you a couple of um, where a couple of things are on the website. OK, so <clears throat> this is obviously the English language a um, web page. Um, so exemplars from summer 2018 will be coming um, within the next couple of weeks and they will appear here under teaching and learning materials uh, and then under exemplars. You can see here the commentary writing support pack and exemplars if you've missed that for any reason and the pre first assessment coursework exemplars that we had here. <clears throat> Uh, but I would recommend waiting for the new ones because I think they'll be more useful because they were written specifically with this um, specification in mind. I'll just see if my um, coursework, right, my coursework clinic pack is not up yet. I have asked for it to go up, so um, I will get that put up today. So the, the documents that I was talking about today will be up. Uh, within a day or two here under past training content. Um, um, let's see if there's anything else I should show you. Um, so I just spoke to you about the um, submission guidance. So when it comes to submitting coursework either in January or in summer 2019, the front sheet is here. If you're doing the spoken language endorsement, the front sheet is there. And um, this was the document that I prepared prior to the summer series. Um, and it just told you um, the entry codes. So remember that the entry codes are in the information manual. Let's just see. Um, now that link is not correct, so let's just get you to the information manual. So if you just, this is quite important, I've had a lot of questions about this lately um, because there are now a lot of um, entry codes. So if you're in the UK, you go to the UK one obviously, and if you're international, you go to the international one, and that does matter because of uh, the R papers. So those of you who are um, teaching abroad, so not outside the UK, um, some of you will be using regional papers and you do need to consult the international one. 
But if we just go here, I'll just show you the entry codes because there are now an awful lot of options. Uh, here we go. So you'll see here, there are all these different option codes and it all depends on if you're doing papers one and two, one and two with the spoken language, one and three. So all of you who are speaking now, I, uh, listening now, you probably are doing either, you need option code B or BE if your students are doing the spoken language endorsement. <clears throat> But then there are also all these different options for those of you who are carrying forward either a coursework, coursework marks or a spoken language endorsement grade from a previous series. So there are a lot of codes now, unfortunately. So 4EA1 is the main entry code, but then you have to also enter the correct option. Um, on the marking front, has J CQ offered any examples of what they consider general feedback? Um, no, it's very, it's really tricky. So they haven't, they just, that's what they say. They just say general feedback allowed. And as the awarding organization, that's what we also have to say. So, um, but I think it's, the intention is clear. So, um, there isn't an awful lot that you're allowed to say um, on a one-to-one -one basis because a lot of it would fall into that category, wouldn't it, of, oh, I'm telling the student here how to meet assessment objectives better. So um, the best way, I think, to, to, to handle it and stay within the regulations is to use things like checklists, like the one that I've provided. I'm glad you like it. <clears throat> But also you can do whole class feedback, can't you? So you can demonstrate to a whole class um, the sort of things that probably all of them need to do. So if you're thinking about, um, you know, the signposting of the argument in assignment A, you can show them an essay that they've written on something else, like, for example, um, uh, an essay on one of the individual texts from uh, that they've done on one of the individual texts on the in the anthology and as a whole class you can look at the signposting in it so you can you could you can do focused mini exercises and then send them off to to apply that to um to their work their actual coursework and that's a way of providing the feedback to everybody um, but staying at a general level and not telling people individually you need to do X to make your coursework better. Um, so some of you are needing to sign off. As I said, that's absolutely fine. Um, I've got sort of nine minutes, eight minutes left on the clock. So I'm going to carry on just showing you around a few things and answering any questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, but if you need to go, that's fine. Um, yeah, so that's the information manual, um, and um, so yeah, I was just talking about the submission guidance actually, wasn't I? So I was just saying, you've got the entry codes, um, for summer you always have to submit everything by the 15th of May, so that will be the 15th of May 2019. The mark schemes are in the specification. Sometimes people aren't sure. Um, there's some advice on standardizing and annotating, how to put the folder together, where to find grade boundaries, and then how to enter the marks on Edexcel online, how to find out who your moderator is. So everything you need for a submission is there. Uh, okay, exam, under the exam materials you've got the summer papers and mark schemes and in case you don't know, these, <clears throat> these ones that are marked are, are the regional papers. So in different parts of the world, um, Australia, Asia Pacific, I can't remember all the list, um, you're required to teachers teaching there have to use an R paper 
for security reasons because the time difference is large to GMT. So for those of you teaching, uh, for, for everybody really, these also just provide additional practice papers, which is really great actually. So um, it means sort of compared to the UK GCSE, you have far more papers because at every series, there's also a regional paper. Um, so you can use any of those to practice with your students. <clears throat> You've got your coursework title guidance there, which I mentioned earlier on. Um, if you haven't seen it, the I've updated these documents. Um, these show um, the sample assessment material, the specimen paper, and then the summer 18, 2018 questions all in a row so that you can see the pattern of the question setting. Um, and yeah, I updated that with the summer paper. So you, you've now got three sets of questions. I hadn't thought about it actually, but I could add the R papers into that as well. Uh, and then you would see um, even more papers all together. So I might do that actually when I have time. <clears throat> well, I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about today. So thanks very much for joining me. Um, I'll just stay online for a few more minutes. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Um, and otherwise, I uh, hope you might be able to join me for that network in due course. I'll just show you that again in case you missed it at the beginning. So on the 8th of November, from 4 to 5.30, I'll be doing uh, an online network and um, I haven't fixed the agenda yet. I'm going to wait and see what you ask for. Um, and I'll publish it nearer the time. I'll just show you where you can book that. So actually there's a link to book it onto it um, here. Here, free online network. So you just go there and then just click on the link here and that will allow you to register for the event like you did for this one. OK, I'm going to close the session. Thanks very much. I hope you have a good day and a good week and I look forward to speaking to you on another occasion. Thanks very much.